Well, good morning, church. It's good to be with you today. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier. Um, today's sermon topic is PG-13. So if you've got kids or uh, middle schoolers, I will say personally, if I had a middle schooler, I would be okay with them being a part of this. But I know for some people, um, maybe not. And so we have uh, a lot of kids stuff over in our North Building. You can go there at any time. Or maybe you're an adult and you're like, I don't want to hear about this. You can go over there as well. <laughs> That's totally cool. Um, but we are continuing our uh, You Asked For It series. And, uh, man, I love this series. I've done this one other time, and it's so funny. Like, we always, we poll people, but, like, I always know exactly what people are going to vote for. It's like the same stuff every time, right? Um, but what we did is we, we basically, we literally polled um, our, uh, our church and people in our community, anybody online who wanted to be a part of it. And we said, hey, what, what do you want to hear a, a sermon about? Like, what, what do you want to hear us preach about? And so we took the top four topics, and today we are talking about sexuality and gender, okay? This is your fault, not mine, okay, by the way, right? This is, you asked for it, uh, you, you all picked this, you voted for this. I didn't vote, okay, y'all voted. Um, but, uh, but I wanna tell you this today, listen, take a deep breath. Exhale. We're gonna get through this together, okay? We're gonna get through this together, right? It's like, yeah, how are you doing today? A lot better than me, that's for sure, right? Because I got to get up here and talk about this. I was joking with someone earlier, y'all, y'all don't pay me enough for this, right? Y'all, 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 don't, y'all don't pay me enough for this. And if this is your first time at New Day, I am so sorry, right? Come back next week, it's more normal. And if you invited a friend today, you messed up. So anyway, you know it's bad, but it's like, man, I just wish you would talk about tithing. You know, I just wish you would talk about tithing. But once again, I, I, I joke, but honestly, I am, I'm really thankful. I, I was actually hoping this would be one of the things we would get to talk about in this series because, you know, I think it's like the, the elephant, not just in the culture, it's like the elephant in the church, if, if we're honest. Because I think if you're here and if you know our church, like you, you, you know where we stand probably. Like you know you've never seen uh, like, a, like a rainbow flag on the front of the church. You know that. Like you, you know, especially with all the stuff happening in our culture today with, uh, with transgenderism, like you, you probably know that I'm not going to show up next week as a different gender. Like you probably have a, a sense of like, okay, I kind of know what's happening here. Like as we talk about all these things today, like you're, you're probably aware that when it comes to the topic of like pornography, that we're going to say that that is not God's design. You should not do that. And so I don't think there's going to be anything in particular that is uh, really different. But what I think it really does is it gives me a chance to talk about this topic from like a really honest and heartfelt perspective. I don't think most people have ever heard like a real message as to, okay, the church believes X, Y, Z. Why does the church believe X, Y, Z? And even if the church believes X, Y, Z, why why is it a good thing? Like, why, why would the church do something as opposed to something else? And I think that this gives us an opportunity to talk about that. You know, one of the things we're really big on also here at New Day, and you've probably picked up on this, we are very, like, apolitical. And so, like, I'm, we're not going to endorse, like, candidates. We don't get into politics. We talk about life. And we also believe, like, this is my theory. My theory is that, like, 85% of Americans are just like reasonable, down-to-earth people. I think 15% of America is like hopelessly politically polarized, but I think the vast majority of people are just trying to live their life and pay their bills and do their job that they don't like to go to, you know, and like raise the whiny kids. Like we're just all doing like normal stuff, you know, eating lunch. Like it's just the normal things in life that we're doing. And I also think that most people understand that different people believe different things. And we do believe beliefs have consequences. But one of the beautiful things about, um, I believe, about America, the place that we live in, is that it is a place where Um, Listen, there are consequences for what you believe, but you are free to pursue what you believe to be true. And and I don't hate you because you believe something different than me. And so that's the thing we got to get rid of is like all this, like you hate me if you don't think like me. I I don't think people across the, the real political spectrum, most people don't think that. And so we've got to be careful not to let like the very vocal, very upset, 
vocal minority control the narrative, you know? <laughs> like we know people have differences of opinions and we know they matter and we're gonna talk about that. But I think deep down we, all, we understand that people come from different places and we can still get along. I just wanna start by saying that. But the other reason why I'm excited to talk about this is because like everybody's talking about this. Like if you're on social media or if you're on the news, like everybody's talking about these things about gender and, and sexuality. And if the church is silent, if we don't say anything, then we're just allowing the culture to do things that we ultimately believe in many ways lead to more chaos. And if there's one way that really emphasizes this for me, it was about maybe a year and a half ago when I took my, uh, my daughter out for uh, a daddy-daughter date night. And uh, she likes to get, go to a movie and Froyo, so that's what we did. We got frozen yogurt at Sweet Frog here in the neighborhood. And uh, we're getting Sweet Frog and we're hanging out. And I was just enjoying my time with her. This was not like a me probing into her life very deep. She was five at the time. And so she's just like wanting to ask, you know, like if she can watch Spirit or, you know, if I can get her another pony tail holder or whatever. Like that's all she was talking about. But we're sitting there having Froyo and... Out of nowhere, she says to me, Daddy, can girls marry girls? She's five, five years old. And it was in that moment where I realized that my daughter was growing up in a very different world than I grew up in. Now listen, I grew up going to public school. I grew up here in the neighborhood. Even most of my friends growing up were not Christians. And so I did not grow up in like a bubble in a sense. I wasn't homeschooled. I didn't live out in the suburbs. Like I didn't grow up in that environment at all, right? I grew up in a very normal environment like most of you. But I didn't remember asking that question when I was five years old. And it just reminded me that we have to talk about these things from a biblical perspective. We have to explain to people kind of why the Bible says what it says and let people make a decision for the way that they will pursue in this life. And what I also think is interesting, and as I was kind of studying this this week, because I think all of us can kind of get like in our own world, I think that we're getting into a very interesting moment where even like a lot of the people that I know that would, be, that would consider themselves progressives, um, are becoming uncomfortable with some of the things that are happening in the world. That's a, that's a new phenomenon. And one example, and I'm not like a huge like, you know, Joe Rogan, like, you know, fanboy or anything like that, but I, I do listen from time to time and I follow some of his stuff on, on YouTube. But if you don't know Joe Rogan or if you're maybe older, like you don't know what a podcast is, it's like a, like a radio program on the internet. Just think of it like that, okay? <laughs> podcast, it's like, anyway. But he has the number one podcast by a lot in America. So more people listen to this guy talk every single day uh, than anybody else in America, which is crazy, right? No, like people listen to his voice, Joe Rogan's voice. And he's just like a dude. He's like an actor, was really into like MMA, just kind of, he's a comedian, all this kind of stuff. Uh, he's just a dude, but he has a podcast and talks about a lot of different things. And recently he's been in the news because he's a progressive guy. And so he, he supports like gay marriage and things like that. But he has recently said that he thinks that like transgenderism is not right. And like, you know, like women should not transition and play in men's sports and vice versa. And so he's got a lot of pushback for that. So he's currently embroiled in a controversy where he is like a progressive who is being attacked by other progressives because he's not progressive enough. And so there's this like new phenomenon happening where even on people that would say they're more progressive are like saying or asking the question, I don't know, are we progressing past like sanity? Like, like there's, there's a question and people are asking these things because not only are there things that we're talking about, but things are rapidly happening. And if you're paying attention to the world, here's what you need to know. And we're going to talk about all these things today for, for in a little bit. But like the conversation today isn't just on like, you know, gay marriage or, or things like that. Like that, that's old news. For, for if you have kids, like that's old news for them. Like transgenderism, that's, that's the new thing. Like, and that is rapidly becoming a new phenomenon. And so the question is like, well, well, what is that? And is that okay? And if I have kids, like, what should I talk to them about when it comes to that? And why should we either be okay with it or not be okay with it? And so we need to talk about these things because God has a good plan. In Isaiah 40 verse eight, and this is so true, it says, the grass withers, the flower fades, and I would add, the culture changes, but the word of our God stands forever. 
And what I think is so incredible is today we're going to open up Mark chapter 10. So if you have a Bible, you can go to Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 6. I'm going to read to you something today that was literally written 2,000 years ago. And no matter what you believe, it is true that this was written 2,000 years ago. And I get to stand up on a stage and proclaim this to you today and compel you to trust the Lord with your life, with your family, with your sexuality, with every part of your being. I get to compel you to to think about this, to follow Jesus in this. And do you know how many times the culture has changed since this was, was written? The ups and the downs, there's been periods in human history where there was like, I mean, anything went sexually. There's been times where there was like almost nothing was permitted sexually. There's been all different kinds of things. And yet as Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, the word of God stands forever. I think it is a very compelling thing and something that I want to compel us to take seriously today. So this time, would you stand with me? And I'm going to read the word of God for us. Mark 10 verses six through nine. These are the words of Jesus. He says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. May God bless the reading of his word. You can be seated. So if I had to sum up in kind of a big picture sense, kind of really what Christianity teaches, not what it teaches, but why it teaches it, I want to give you a quick um, sentence as we start our time. That compared to current Western culture, the Christian sexual and gender ethic is radically narrow because we love and trust Jesus more than our desires and feelings. That's an important thing to think about. Like, listen, I'm never going to lie to you. I'm never going to front to you. Like, I believe in the Bible. I love Jesus. I got really serious about my faith in high school, and I had to change a lot of things in my life. The word repent in the Bible literally means to change your mind. And so like I used to think one thing, but then I started following Jesus and I realized I had to get um, in alignment with things that he said because I trusted that he was good. And all of us go through that process. And I say compared to the current Western culture, because what you need to know is that what we're talking about today is not a thing all across the world. This conversation is not happening in most African countries. It's not happening in a lot of uh, South American countries. You know, we're, we're Americans in the Western world, and so we think, like, the world revolves around us. But we're just one culture in the world, and and our culture, the culture that you live in, for the most part, tends to be the most overall progressive in all the world. And so we, we are not, it's not just like, well, everybody in the world's doing X, Y, Z. It's like, no, Christianity is going rapidly in China, uh, South America, Africa. It's not really growing much, honestly, in America. But we're just one part in the world, but it's the part of the world that we happen to live in. But yes, compared to current Western culture, the Christian sexual and gender ethic is radically narrow. But here's the reason why. Because we love and trust Jesus more than our feelings and desires. It's just a decision that we make as Christians. That we have feelings, we have desires, we have wants. But we don't just do whatever those things lead us to do. That we are actually skeptical of ourselves and many things that we want to do. I experience this in my marriage all of the time, right? There are moments in my marriage where I have a desire or a feeling uh, to maybe uh, lose my cool, which happens from time to time. Housley can tell you that, right? Because I'm a normal person. Or maybe not be as kind or as loving as I want to be. And sometimes those things happen. But I ultimately know that's not right. And so I'm not aiming to do those things. And when I go to those places, I ask for forgiveness. And if I had to sum up really in one phrase Um, really why Christians believe what they believe from a gender or sexuality perspective. If I'm honest, maybe the real difference from the world around us is that we have a deep conviction. This is maybe the most important thing I'll say all day to sum up everything. 
Sex is not God. Sex is not God. I'm going to do it. Turn to your neighbor and say, sex is not God. (laughs) They say when you say things, you remember them more. So I have to do that sometimes. Sex is not God. And so what that means is that therefore it submits ultimately to something else. That as Christians, we are different than the world. And what is interesting is people think that that's like something new, but specifically in our context, and you know this if you know history, in the 1960s, there was something called the the sexual revolution. And um, in the 1950s and the early 60s, there was a very unique time. And here's what most people don't realize. Like the majority of human history has not agreed with the Christian sexual ethic. Like here in a moment, I'm going to read a passage where Paul talks about um, how, you know, certain things sexually are not permissible per the scriptures. But I will tell you that he writes that to a culture that would make ours blush. And so we have this sense of like, well, back in the day, everybody was like, I don't know, like homeschool or prude or whatever. And I'm not saying those things go together. Don't be, don't, please don't email me. My wife was homeschooled. I was public schooled. We got the whole thing covered or whatever. But like, it's like, yeah, back then, but no, no, back, like, like the vast majority of, of, of human culture has been very sexually promiscuous overall. But there was this almost like a very unique time in American culture post-World War II where um, in a lot of ways, the culture at large in our nation agreed with what the church teaches, that marriage is between a man and a woman for life. Like the culture was in agreement with that. But that was a, that was a rarity. That, that's not common. And most of us think that's how all of human history to some degree has been. But now it's just different. But that was a rare moment in time. But in the 1960s, there's a sexual revolution. And really in a lot of ways, that was the moment in which the, the culture went a different way from the church. And the big thing in the 60s, as you know, was sex outside of marriage. That was the big change. And so that used to be seen as not good. But then by the time the 80s and 90s roll around, it's in almost every kind of movie and film. And it's even celebrated. It's like if two people really love each other, even if they're not married, that it's a good thing to engage um, in, in relations like that. But even at that moment, the, the church did not change what it believes. And so there's, there's all these different things that have happened. There's all these different changes. And so whether it's like sex outside of marriage or whether it's homosexuality or, or now with like transgenderism, there's all these different kinds of things. There's all these different beliefs. And yet the church has a radically narrow view of sexuality and gender. And we see it in the passage that we just read. In Mark 10, verse 6, Jesus says these words, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And so the culture will tell you that gender is a social construct. And maybe in some ways it is. And that's why, honestly, I don't even like personally to use the words like masculine and feminine because I think people kind of have like loaded like definitions when it comes to those words, right? Um, I just think that when it comes to being a man or woman, we should look to the scriptures and trust whatever it says. Uh, but it says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So the culture will tell you gender is a social construct, but the Bible here says something radically different. And so at that point, we have a choice to make. Do we trust what the Bible says or do we trust what the culture says? And what the Bible says is, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And the Bible says that both are good. Both are good. Whether you're a male or a female, they're both good. And so as Christians, this is why we believe you don't have to change your gender because whatever gender you are, that is good and that is beautiful and that is the way that God designed us. The Bible says in the Psalms that God formed us in the womb. You're not an accident. How you are is not an accident. It is a part of God's good design. And then in verse 7, Jesus goes on. He says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And so we see the beginning of marriage. Marriage is not something that a bunch of smart people got in a room and said, well, this is what marriage is going to be. The Bible says that God created marriage. And then in verse 8, he goes on and says, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. 
And what one flesh there means, it means really two different things. One, it means one flesh in terms of being like you become one person. So you make decisions together and you care for each other. But that one flesh image also refers to sexuality. When a husband and a wife are together intimately, they are literally becoming one flesh in that moment. And what happens in secret, in private, and in intimacy is reflected in all of their relationships. So their, their unity in the bedroom also plays out to their uni, unity in the world around them. The unity they display to their children, to the church, and the culture, and everybody around them. And so here in this moment and all throughout the scriptures, we see that sex is a powerful reality created by God for a divine purpose. It is a powerful force and it binds a man and woman because we need to be bound together in life to raise children and to make it through life. It is a powerful thing with a very unique purpose. And as Christians, we take our desires and we move them in that direction because we love and we trust Jesus. This uh, past uh, summer, I got to go on a trip to Florida. I, um, I met a pastor at a pastor's conference and uh, I was just talking to him and shared with him about how my wife had been diagnosed with cancer and we had been going through a really hard time or whatever. And he's such an incredible person that he offered to fly us out to Florida for a really fun trip for our family. Uh, we got to take our kids on their first ever airplane uh, flight, and it was, it was just so cool. And we did a lot of cool things, but um, one of the, cool, no, the coolest thing that we did uh, was in Jacksonville. If you're ever anywhere near Jacksonville, you have to go there. It, there's this place, I don't even remember what it's called, but... It's basically a place where they've got like a ton of like lions and tigers that you can go see like really up close and personal. Because here's what happens, right? And this, if you've ever been to the zoo, I love the zoo, I love the Houston Zoo. But you go there and it's like there's all these different animals, all these different things you can see. And it's like, you know what? I really just wanna see the lions and tigers and bears. You know, oh my, yes, you can say that, right? <laughs> Like, I want to see the gorilla. That's really, like, okay, iguana, cool. You know, like, monkey, all right, you know. But I'm, my favorite animal has always been, like, the lions and the tigers. But here's what happens. You go to the zoo, and it's like there's one lion, but he's, like, up on the top, so far away, sleeping. And all you can see is his, like, butt. Like, that, that's how it is, right? That's what it's like when you go to the zoo. He's never awake, never doing nothing. You know, it's just, it's just nothing, right? This place is different, though, because they understand that. And what this place does is they're only open from 2 to 5 every day. And the reason they're only open from 2 to 5 every day is because that's when they feed them every day. So they're all awake and they're all very ready to engage with you. And so what's really cool is I didn't know it was going to be this cool, but we went to this place. And I mean, it was like, it, it was it was incredible. It was like, like the best, like, you know, animal experience I've ever had. So I've got a, this is a picture up here of one of the lions. And like, I was literally like that close to this like lion. And all that was between me and the lion was literally that chain link fence. I think we also might have a video up here, possibly. Let's see if we have a video. That's my daughter. <laughs> Look at that animal, guys. You don't get that at the zoo, right? How close. But go back to the other, go back to the other picture and just kind of leave it there for a moment. I, I took that picture and I'll say two things about this experience. Number one, it was really cool. But if I'm honest, it was also, um, it was a little bit scary to realize that um, all that stood in between me and this, you know, powerful beast that would gladly rip me to shreds was a fence. And I can, I can have this picture and I can show you this and I can believe in my heart hearts, think about this, like I can believe that this lion is a beautiful, majestic creature and I can look and I can marvel and I can think that. But think about this for a moment as, as you look at that picture. 
just for whatever reason, imagine that like fences didn't exist. Imagine that. For whatever reason, human, the world, fences have never been created ever. We can't figure that out. What I'm telling you and what crossed my mind was I would never think that this animal was beautiful or majestic. It would be a terror. It would be, it would be a monster. It would not be a blessing to me. It would ultimately be a threat to me. And I say that because I think when we think about sex or even gender, all, all these things, what I want to tell you is as we think about these things, what we are thinking about is something that is very unique, very powerful, very good and very beautiful, but that there is a design to it. And, and what I am telling you and asking you, don't just believe this because I say this, but listen to the word of God and look out in the world out there that when you take fences down, when anything goes, that does not ultimately lead to human flourishing. And one of the ways I think this is uniquely demonstrated, and, and I'm just laying this before you. This is not, I'm not trying to say like, oh, this is like crazy. I'm not trying to make you scared. I'm saying I literally looked up this week. Uh, you know about the LGBTQIA+. Um, I, I looked it up. Uh, go to GoodRx, um, and you can go look this up on your own. Um, but I, I, I mean it when I say, as I, as I read through these things today, and I think most of us, we kind of, we bury our heads in the sand. We, we don't want to think about it, but like this is like a very real thing. L stands for lesbian. G stands for gay. B stands for bisexual, which that is the most common thing today. I'm not sure if you know that. Like amongst the teens today, um, a lot more identify as bisexual than gay or lesbian. So once again, like, like gay or lesbian, that's, that literally is like old news in, in the world that people are growing up in today. The other thing is, is transgender, meaning you are born one gender, but you identify and live as another gender. The Q stands for queer, um, but queer is an umbrella term for people who are, are not exclusively straight or gay, which primarily manifests in four different ways. One is non-binary, um, which somebody who is non-binary, they do not identify as a male or female, just something else. There's also gender fluid. This is another very common one, meaning their gender identity constantly changes back and forth. So they're like, I'm not a guy or a girl. I go back and forth depending on how I feel. Um, there's gender queer, which does not identify fully as a man or woman and sexually does not identify um, as gay or straight. And so uh, gender and sexual orientation are both fluid and both on a spectrum. So I am fluid in my gender, whether I'm a guy or girl, and I'm also fluid as to what I prefer depending on what I, whether I'm a guy or girl, but it, that can also change as well. Then there's gender nonconforming which means does not abide by gender expectations, um, or it's a man who identifies as a woman but still dresses like a man and engages in relations with a, a woman. Then there's intersex, which is the I, which is born with differences in gender traits. There's asexual, which means someone who doesn't really, uh, who lacks sexual attraction, which is so interesting. It's like they might just not be as into sex, but we have to label that, and that's like a thing. Um, then there's the, there's, there's the plus, right? And that's the thing about this is that because there are, are many things consistently being discovered, uh, new mixtures and, and ways they present themselves. And so we, we never want to leave anything out. And maybe the newest thing, and, and once again, this is on the website. This is not like a fringe thing. This is a part of it. And so, you know, during Pride Month, what I'm about to tell you is one of the things that will be celebrated. Um, there's a new thing called Two Spirit. I'm not sure if you've heard of this. Um, and so there's LGBTQ2S, and I'll just read it straight off of what the uh, article says. Uh, Two-spirit is a male or female or intersex person who have, both male and, who, who have both the male and female spirit within them. So, so they are not, um, two-spirit is not I am male or female or I'm even fluid. I am always both at the same time if that makes any sense. 
Um, they are always both at the same time. It is also now being referred to as essentially a third gender. So there's going to be, in the future, they believe for sure, there's going to be like male and female. Then there's just like both. And it is seen as wrong to refer to them as gender fluid because they are not fluid. They are always both at the same time. That's called two-spirit. LGBTQ2S is the new thing. Now, but here's, here, here's what I want to tell you. There might be a temptation for me to read that and you to hear that and think like, wow, like that's crazy or that's X, Y, Z. But here's what I want to tell you. It's not. It's not crazy. And, and we need to stop saying that, right? Number one, because it is disrespectful. But number two, because it is a logical outcome and consequence of a secular worldview, and so what we are saying today is that as followers of Jesus, we love everybody. We genuinely love everybody, but, but we say, hey, listen, but, but we follow this path and we follow this path because we love Jesus and we trust that his plan is good for us and for human flourishing in general. And when we read these things, we understand that is a logical outworking of that worldview. And we do not believe that that ultimately leads to human flourishing. And so what we see here in this moment is that the problem is for a lot of people, and here's really what it comes down to, and even all those things that I read, at the end of the day, we have a different worldview, and our worldview is that sex is not God, meaning that sex can be said no to, that we can have desires, we can feel desires, and it's not wrong to feel a desire. It's not wrong to be tempted. It's not wrong. It's not a sin to have same-sex attraction. It's not a sin to be drawn to pornography. Those are not sins. The temptation in and of itself is not the sin. What it is is when we begin to live in accordance with these things that God says are not the way that we are ultimately designed. The culture that we live in generally believes that sex and feelings are God. They have to be obeyed at all costs. And as Christians, we kindly and generously disagree and we believe that Jesus is God, and because sex is not God, sex can therefore submit to something else. And so I say that because that's why when we come to passages in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, this can make a lot more sense because we just hop to these passages and we don't understand why it says something. And then we're like, wow, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I never heard that. And in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul says, or do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, what I want to point out in this passage, because I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. And as I was studying this this week, you know, because I think we all like, we, we all read this and we, we see certain things or we're drawn to certain things. But here's what I want you to know. Here's what most people miss. As you read this, here's what you need to know. You're in this. You're in this. We're all in this. <laughs> Neither the sexually immoral. Who is not sexually immoral to a degree? Jesus said, even if you just lust after somebody, you sin. And so this is not pointing out like, you might say, oh, it points out homosexuality. Oh, it points out swindlers. What, what are even swindlers? What is that, you know? Like, what is a reviler? You know, <laughs> we're all in this. He says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were changed, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You see, what Paul is saying here in this moment is that everyone is sexually broken, that everyone is offered forgiveness, and the difference is ultimately in how we respond. The difference is in how we respond. As, as Christians, we are not better than anybody else. We are not more moral than anybody else. In fact, what's interesting about Christians is in some ways we're probably the most immoral of all because we knew we needed forgiveness. I know I'm a sinner. 
okay? I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And like everybody else, I am sexually broken. I have things that I want to do that I probably should not do. And everybody else does. And can we be real about that in church or we got to lie about it? Or act like it's not true? Or act like the bad guys are out there? But I'm good. I got nothing to repent of because I'm good. And what's interesting is Paul says in this passage, he says, do not be deceived. And those are powerful words because it says you can be deceived on this. Paul says those words for a reason because there is a temptation for us to be deceived. And what's interesting is whenever Paul wrote this, he wrote this to the church in the ancient city called Corinth. And this city, the people he's writing to, the things that they were doing in this time would have made our modern day drag queens blush. You can look it up for yourself, the things that were happening. He actually mentions it in the book of like 1 Corinthians. He mentions some of the things that are happening. And guys, it is like, oh my goodness. It was like out in the open. And what was happening was the gospel was going into a broken pagan culture where everything went, which is kind of the path that we're going on right now. Everything went, and, but then the gospel um, was planted and people began coming to Jesus and going to church and it, they were like having a, a really good experience and they were loving the hope and the spirituality. They'd go to church and be a wonderful experience. And then they would leave, and it was a common practice for often guys to, have, when they were leaving church, they would go and stop um, to meet up with a local prostitute. But here's the thing they didn't think there was anything wrong with that. They, they weren't trying to be rebellious, they just had no idea. And so Paul actually writes this letter to them saying, no, 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 look, all of your life comes under the lordship of Jesus Christ, not just, not just your spirituality. And for a lot of us, that's our experience. For a lot of us, like, man, I, I like Jesus and I like church, but I also kind of want to be okay with some of these other things. And I'm aware for, for some of you, you're like, man, like, I, I like New Day. I, I like the church. I, I like the music. I usually like your preaching, John, but not today, you know. Like, I don't know if I can ever come back here ever again because you believe this. But my response to you is that sex isn't God. And if, if this thing has the ability to make you walk away from God, you have to ask yourself the question, who is your God? And what I believe is ultimately as, as Christians is that we have to know that Jesus is making us new and Jesus is changing us. And I think also as a pastor, I have a, a unique perspective in this because, you know, most people just live their lives or they know their family. And if, you have seen, if you've seen some of the things I've seen as a pastor, like you, you would take this so much more seriously. Like, I, man, I have sat in rooms, this is real, so I've sat in rooms with men who are about to leave their wife. And at the very least, I respect their honesty where they're basically like, you know what? I don't want to be with her anymore. Like, they're saying this to her. And she's in the room and I'm in the room, you know? And, and I'm, I'm like, why? And he's like, because I'm attracted to somebody else. I want to do something else. I want to go somewhere else. And in that moment, like, what should I tell them? No. <laughs> Restrain yourself. That's not good. See, everybody practices sexual restraint. And we act like we live in a world today where, like, like it's wrong to tell somebody maybe to not do something. And that's also the moment where I realized in moments like that that I'm not a good counselor because I don't want to counsel him. I want to punch him in the face, you know, when, when those things are happening. It's like, I give him like the, the, the right hand of fellowship, you know, like, it's just like, are you kidding me? And so that's why the, listen, we, we all have things in our lives, even in marriage, as we seek to be faithful to our spouse, there are ways in which we have to ultimately submit our sexuality to Jesus so a few things really quick before we close. Number one, how do we apply this to our lives? This is what the scripture would compel us to do. Number one, submit your sexuality to Jesus because he is God and sex isn't. Submit your sexuality to Jesus because he is God and sex isn't. I love you. I love you enough to tell you, do not follow your feelings. It will not lead you in the end to a good place. It, it just won't. Like, like, 
Everybody that blows up their life, like it's, it's it, like we should be scared of our feelings, not trusting of them. No, nobody willingly becomes a drunkard or gets into a crazy sexual situation or wakes up one day and says, I'm going to commit an affair. No, nobody does that. Those are people that gave in to, to feelings and to not virtue. Their, their sexuality was ultimately not submitted to Jesus. It is good for us. Number two, uh, educate yourself with real people who wrestle with same-sex attraction yet joyfully submit their sexuality to Jesus. Now, I, I hate when people say educate yourself. That's kind of arrogant, you know. So I'm not saying like educate yourself. I, I don't like people do that a lot in the world today. I, I, this is the only way I can phrase it. Um, there are people, there are Christians that most of us have just, we're not aware of their work. We know what the Republicans think. We know what the Democrats think. We know what some influence on social media thinks. Um, but there are so many faithful Christians uh, who have uh, same-sex attraction or various different kinds of things um, that they have in their life that they do not act on um, because they are joyfully submitted to Jesus. And I've actually got three of them up here right now. I encourage you to look these people up. Um, they all have books that I have written. They are incredible. Um, uh, Jackie Hill Perry wrote a book called uh, Gay Girl, Good God. Um, she um, came out of a life of same-sex attraction, and she is now married with kids. Uh, Re Rebecca McLaughlin is the same way. Uh, Sam Albury is a guy who has same-sex attraction to men and lives a single celibate life in submission to uh, Jesus. And I think for a lot of us, we've just never been exposed. We don't even think that that's a possibility. But we read those things. A couple more things really quick. Um, Rejoice in being disliked by others due to your commitment to Jesus because it is an essential part of your discipleship. This is a really important one. You know, we often want to find the right way to communicate Christian convictions in a way that, like, people might not be mad at us or might not think less of us. And here's the truth. You can't. In John 15, verse 18, Jesus says, If the world hates you, no one has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus could not say things in a way that made everybody like him. And maybe for a lot of us, the real challenge in this issue is we're learning that we can't live for the approval of others and we're kind of addicted to that. And I, listen, I'm, I'm probably a little bit more of, of like an assertive personality, so it's not easy for me either, but it's probably a little easier for me. I really have great empathy for people who are like, you're just really, really nice people. My wife's like that. You're just really nice. And you want everyone to like you and think well of you. And listen, I, I know it, like, like the thought of like conflict for you, like cr you'd rather really jump off a cliff, you know, than like have an argument. Like I know some people like that is your thing. And just see this as a thing like, listen, like you, you can't say it perfect. Jesus couldn't figure out how to say it perfectly. There are things as Christians that, that we will say that people will not like. And that's okay. Next one, bring all of your sexual sins, sexual confusion, or sexual longing to Jesus. All of us are broken. All of us have made mistakes. And there's forgiveness for you. There is. There is. Jesus can forgive sin. Jesus can bring clarity and confusion. And Jesus can bring fulfillment and longing. One of the greatest examples in all the scripture is the woman caught in adultery. And there's a story in the Gospels where a woman is caught in adultery and they bring her to Jesus and she's, she's naked because they caught her in the act. And they throw her before uh, the, uh, the, this crowd, these religious leaders throw her before the, the crowd. And they ask Jesus to condemn her because they know what Jesus believes, that you shouldn't commit adultery. And she just did. And Jesus says the famous line that he who is without sin cast the first stone. And I love it because in this moment, he basically says, I am not going to condemn you like everybody else wants to. And so here, God is in the presence of a woman caught adultery. And he says, I want to forgive you. I am your protector. But then he says, go and sin no more. And so there's some of us, we, we just want to act like things aren't sin when they are. Other ones of us, we, we want to be self-righteous and judgmental, which is a very real thing and probably more common in the church. And, and Jesus is neither. Because Jesus 
is perfect. And so bring your confusion about this issue, even if you wrestle with this, bring this to Jesus. And then lastly, love all but follow one. Love everybody. Jesus told us in Matthew 5, we have to love everybody. Uh, We can't be a jerk for Jesus. That's not a spiritual gift. Uh, That's not a good thing. Um, Even our enemies, which I'm not saying people that disagree with us are even our enemies, but even if somebody was your enemy, you are called ultimately to love them. Be kind to everybody. Be kind to everybody at all times, but only follow Jesus. So as we draw to a close, I want to close with one verse um, that I, I read earlier in the service where Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And if I'm honest, as we draw to a close today, um, I really want you to hear this part. I think this might be the most important thing I say today. Um, No matter who you are, single, married, wherever you're at, you know, I think the church has an incredible opportunity in this moment that, that we keep missing, actually. And the, the, the opportunity that we're missing is, listen, our culture is like literally obsessed with sex. Like it's obsessed with sex and sexuality and gender and all. Like it's just obsessed with it. Like it, the whole identity gets wrapped up in it. It's like, if you don't agree with this, you hate me. Like our, our culture is like obsessed with sex because sex is God, meaning it must be pursued at all costs. Everything else must bend to this thing. And the problem with the church, if I'm honest, is we respond often with our own kind of idol. Because here, here's what the church will do then. Oh, man, people are, are, are really into sex or sexuality. And they're, oh, man, they're obsessed with it. So here's what we got to tell them. No, 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 do it God's way. Like, save yourself for marriage and, and then get, get married into a man-woman relationship. And then you'll be married. And then it will be amazing. But the problem is, even the people that do that and follow that, sex can be amazing. But anyone who's ever been married and has ever been honest can say it's not always. In fact, even in marriage, Sex can be weird and confusing sometimes, can't it? (laughs) And then the church gets really weird and we start saying things like, spice it up, you know, or get creative. (sighs) Pastors start doing weird stuff like putting like beds on stage and being provocative and playing up to this, almost this like idol of sex, even in the context of like marriage. (laughs) And I think the problem is in our own way, we, we idolize sex and we put so much pressure on this thing to fulfill us. And (laughs) <laughs> now, I'm going to say this, and listen, you, you could never come back to this church ever again. I totally respect that, you know. I, I totally, listen, no judgment, you know. When I pass you in Kroger, it's totally cool, you know. Like, it's, it's not a big deal, you know. But I really think what I'm going to say today is going to set somebody free. Listen, like, sex, it just is what it is. And I think the message of the church to the culture shouldn't be, well, just do it God's way and, you know, and then it's going to be amazing because then people get in marriages and it's maybe not amazing or it's complicated or it's difficult or not as frequent as you want it to be. And listen, I am all about trying to make it as good as you can in the context of marriage. Listen, do all those things. That's a good thing. But I really think the compelling message that would set people free in this world is simply just, Jesus is better than sex. That's the message. That we put so much pressure on this thing called sex to give us so much fulfillment. 
It's like, so if we're single, then we're not content, you know, or if we're married, it's, it's, not, it's not good enough. And, and we start to think this thing is so important, but it's like, and then it doesn't make weird things where it's like you, like you don't like getting older because you're not as attractive as you used to be. And so you're 40, but you got to feel like you got to look 20. Like, can we just let things be what they are and say that we worship Jesus and that Jesus is our fulfillment? The sex cannot fulfill you, even in the context of marriage. And that if we would just lessen the pressure of this thing and say, man, it's a gift that God gives for a certain purpose, but it's not everything, that would actually be a message of hope to the entire world. Guys, we can just chill out. It's just a thing. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But that is our declaration, that Jesus is what we need, that we will receive whatever else he gives. But Jesus is our ultimate satisfaction. Church, may that be our declaration to the world.